And I think this is a really important conversation to start with that, that violence, the abuse doesn't really have borders. It goes across genders, it goes across ages, and it goes across countries as well, because we see cultural perspectives that allow different level of violence, whether the culture is within one country, whether it's minority cultures or different cultures around being a man, being a woman, or what we call international cross-cultural conversation coming from cultures that this is more acceptable and less acceptable. As first, we would like to sort of unpack and zoom out and create a better space to understand what is the anatomy of violence, if, if we can explain it that way. And then we're going to go into specific strategies and what can be done. So the conversation is about how to be confident, feel confident and safe in any situation. And that really brings us to ability to master our minds, our body through different strategies so we can understand when we are in danger and how is it different from the myths that we have that we tell ourselves. We're going to go into a little bit of discussion of what safe really is and what it is not. We will talk about the role of you in any situation and how you can be part of the conversation, no matter how unpowered, disempowered you may feel. And we will look a lot into what confidence is and what confidence is not. This is our overall agenda. So I'd like to start with three myths that allow us to zoom out and see the bigger picture. The first myth is that unsafe is only when you're actually attacked in a crisis situation. The crisis moment is a very dangerous place for many people, but there are two more levels back where we actually can step more into the power of self. There is a concept of threatening landscape, and what that means is that situation where you do not necessarily attacked, but you're not feeling safe for various reasons. It could be being in the uh, boardroom where you're dominated by people who you do not perceive friendly. It could be like I feel right now, being a Russian and being addressed in different ways about the Ukrainian conflict, even though I have nothing to do with Ukraine for the last 25 years, I believe, in the United States. It could be the minority conversation. It could be the being the only woman in the male-dominated place. It could be whatever it is that makes your feel kind of tense and feeling not very safe. But that's the place where you're not literally attacked. And that's the place where we can start using some techniques and strategies we will be discussing today. And then there is this concept of just life work experiences, the zone where we can step out and practice, get prepared for all of this. So when we're in the red zone of attack, we have additional support systems that we built preventively. Perfect. If you have a couple words on that, how do you put this in the context when you work with your clients? You know, this, this is such a great way to look at it because you're right. People do think of, you know, I'm unsafe when I'm being attacked and it's the only time they think of it. And what I'll share with them is uh, if that's the only time you think of how to take care of yourself, then you've waited till the very last moment. Uh, it's like, you know, not fireproofing your house until the house is on fire. So yeah, there are times before that where you can prepare yourself. Uh, that threatening landscape, you're right, it might be the boardroom where you're just feeling anxious, not necessarily in danger. Or it might be that you live in a dangerous neighborhood or have to travel to a, a dangerous area for your work. Uh, but that place is also a challenge and being prepared can help you to navigate that place. And, and so if yeah. we take it a little bit strategically, the place to start working on yourself is when you're in the green zone and then take this into those uh, situations when you can practice your skills. Right. The place where you build resilience and emotional resilience is kind of in this threatening landscape orange zone, but it's not at the moment of crisis where you are on the autopilot of what your habitual reactions are like. Exactly, exactly. And, and so course, we will be discussing... I was going to say there can be threatening things that do happen in your regular life and at work. But again, that's just like Olga is saying, that's where you want to practice day after day using or being confident, using the skills that we're going to teach you today and that you could learn from us separately as well. 
And so the second myth we want to kind of plant in this conversation and peeing in the background so you can think through different lenses is the difference between being in danger and it's the only physical concept and feeling unsafe. One is much more the acute situation, that's a crisis moment, but feeling unsafe, this is the place where your perception really play a lot of, uh, has a lot of value. And here we want to kind of highlight two things that obviously we can go deeper into this particular one hour conversation, but there always triggers something coming from your past experiences or for your perceptions that for you is a trigger and for me might not be a trigger or vice versa. So it's important to understand that you have some blocks that you can take control over by understanding your triggers. And if it's hard to do on your own, you can work with someone who will help you to do that. And then the second component of this formula, the overwhelm comes from the place that your perceived resources may not be sufficient to deal with the challenges. So the second component where you can revisit what resources you have whether by perceiving them differently or learning to use resources available to you. And Cranford is the master in teaching people how to find those invisible resources in your domain. So we can be much more emotional, stable, stay in that calm intensity place and be resilient to the situation. And way of doing this, Think of those in three buckets, take a note, and then you can ask questions specifically to each of them. Crapper can respond to that. But it's identify your stressors, which is hard to do because we don't remember them. They kind of come in our life in the formative years of our existence where we take things for granted. We don't have filters to think yet about. Then we have this perception, which changes the scope that we perceive of the danger or the situation or our ability to be resilient. The scope has to do with your thinking, with your mindset, with your perceptions and with beliefs and inner dialogue that we listen to. The third bucket is this resources and think of the word recalibrate. There is always something that you can do. When I was kidnapped by this big, fat, huge mafia creature, no way I could win with him if I were to engage in a fight. That was his strength, it was my weakness. But my weakness also meant that I was able to engage into emotional things. I was able to get his, read his emotions better than he was. He was relying too much on his strength. And what he saw is my weakness, my emotional state. He expected me to cry, to back him. I don't know what he was expecting. I knew that I can turn this into my strength because I can read his emotions, I can see what he likes and I can humanize myself because humanizing yourself in the form of a victim is one of the strategies of getting them to the place where they can't quite harm you because you became a human instead of a target to them, which I learned from my work with the special forces, how they train soldiers to kill. They need to take the humanity out and make it a target. And so that was a recalibration component when my weakness became my strength and I found a way to humanize myself enough to wiggle out of the situation. So the question is, who are you, right? That's the main question that we have. And the third myth that we want to, again, pin there so you can think of this when you listen to the strategies that Cranford is gonna take us through is victim is your only options. That who you are and who you choose as your role in any relationship, including the one that is stressful, that is the place where we can make a huge difference. Whether you're a victim or a warrior or aggressor or empowered partner of the conversation, are we different or are we the same? And there's oneness that we can find in our confronting person. So those are three big myths that allow us to expand and zoom out and have the conversation a little bit on a different level. So we can come back to when are you employing which strategies, what it is to be safe and how to expand safety, who you are and how you show up. And most importantly, what is confidence and what it is not and how to become confident even when you feel fear. And so with that, the main question is for Cranford. Cranford, tell us about that 
confidence concept? So, you know, you hear confidence and it's just such a generic term when we hear it, but there are so many specifics where you can use it. You can focus your confidence to specific things. And we've got a little list here. And Olga, I hope you'll jump in when you, if you hear a place where, I mean, I know you have so much history and expertise in business and leadership. Uh, if I miss something there, I want you to jump in and share it. Uh, but we'll start right here with being a leader. Confidence makes you a better leader. It helps people to see what you mean. It helps them to receive the message that you're giving in leadership and management as a, uh, as a thought leader as well. And it also helps you to make your team more effective and more profitable because when they see you being confident, they understand it's safe for them to be confident, which means it's safe for them to be more assertive in their work. It's safe for them to lean into it, to be more creative. And that just works better for any business to have people that are like that. And, you know, we don't just mean your team, of course, your children, your children watch. They may not listen to what you tell them to do, but they certainly watch how you respond and seeing mom and dad being confident and capable. That's what they're going to do, regardless of what they hear you saying to do. So it's really important. Um, and just to add to this, as the resilience coach, you come across the place, how to teach people to take more risks. There is a component of psychological safety, which is fundamental for the discussions about creativity, innovation, resilience, and any form of cultures that create collaboration. Because if people are not confident, not safe to come with an idea that likely will lead to a failure. 85% of all innovations fail. That's uh, statistics that allow you to then take the best idea and take this to the next win. People will not be able to be risk tolerant or there will be risk aversion. And this is what kills creativity, whether it's in your children or whether this is in your teams, the culture of vulnerability. Type A personalities are people who are afraid to show their vulnerability. And there's so many resources, the, the research that shows that it doesn't matter whether you're a woman or a man, the ability to, to inability to show your vulnerability prevents you from collaboration, from asking for support, for delegating to other people who have diversified skills and talents and ultimately affects the diversity in our workplace or in our cultural perspectives. So it really can be a whole conversation just on that alone. But the concept of that psychological safety that we need to build as leaders, whether it's families, communities, or companies, this is the place which always starts with us. If we have a relationship with confidence, we then can take it to the next level and show it to others so they can build it up as well. Yeah, and it's, it's important as we look at those first two to remember that confidence isn't just for you. Confidence affects everyone around you and it affects them in a, in a positive way. And as we go into these others, you know, you can be more engaged in your relationships, whether they're your romantic relationship or, or your work, because that confidence gives you the courage to ask the right questions, to have the difficult conversations, uh, to be more trusting and more trustable. And you know, in those relationships, we need boundaries uh, in every relationship you do. And that confidence helps you to do that, not just to have them, but to actually enforce them because so many people have no idea what to do after their boundaries being crossed. Uh, it also, confidence also acts as a great filter to bring the people that you want to be in your life into your life. The people that believe in growth like you do, the people that believe in, believe in positivity like you do, the people that want to be profitable and prosperous like you do, uh, while keeping out the people that you don't want there, the people that see you maybe as prey to be used or manipulated. Confidence scares those people away because they're looking for people they can manipulate and control. So it's great because it keeps the bullies, the bullies, the manipulators, and people that are just kind of energy averse, it seems like, you know, the poor me people, uh, when you're believing for yourself and your family and your team to move up, always being moving up and, and growing. And it also opens up the room for partnership building, not the hierarchical structure of one submissive to another, 
but the partnership with both partners can grow simultaneously or lead each other in growth. So for example, um, I know that we talk a lot when we deal with relationship in our coaching sessions about um, sexiness. There is an incredible sexiness in a woman who is confident in her own emotions, in her own actions, in her resilient skills. And the difference is not to attract a male, but attract the right person, the man who can stand next to that powerful woman and be a partner that enhances her abilities instead of constantly in competition, who is stronger, who is weaker, and how it goes. It allows that person to also open up to his vulnerability and stay strong in being in that feminine energy of being exposed, feeling vulnerable, feeling open. That is the fundamental requirement for emotional resilience and emotional fitness that every single person in the modern world can benefit from, especially when you lead people, whether it's community, businesses, or in life. And so that is a component that many people never really think about, how strength and confidence allows the softness and vulnerability to blossom next to it because it feels authentic rather than protective and defensive. And so we also have that you can keep yourself safer uh, by removing yourself from predators and abusers' radar. And what that means is those people, because there are women too, normally it's men, those men are looking for people they believe they can manipulate, people they believe they can control, people they believe they are stronger than physically and mentally. And when you're confident, when you believe in yourself, and we're going to talk about that more in just a little bit about how you come to be like that, it messes up their radar. It shows you as a bad target and tells them you just need to move on, not her. She's not the right one. And that's powerful. That's a huge win when predators, jerks, and bullies just want to pass you by. And you remember what I was saying earlier that it, confidence in you affects everyone around you. And that's true, you know, like we talked about as a leader it makes your workplace different because not only are you being confident, you're modeling confidence, trust, care, compassion to your team, making it safe for them to be who they are and to show that their, their gifts, their benefits and how they want to help you. So it really does act as a builder for a whole new culture of safety, of innovation uh, and compassion and support for each other too. And when you change the life of one person, it creates a ripple effect because the more appreciated, valued, listened to, understood person in the office will take that feeling, that contentment back home and will model this to the children, to teens, to those who will be the future tomorrow, right? This culture has this ripple effect. And when we think about transforming self, know that you transform every single person around you who then will transform their people around them. And it's absolutely amazing the impact that we can create by just shifting this cultural perspective. And so the key component here that we keep hearing in comfort is confidence, confidence, confidence. So what is confidence and what it is not? It's a great question. And you know, we can find a whole bunch of definitions for it, but the one that I like and I think is simplest is just believing in yourself and your ability to positively handle whatever situation shows up for yourself uh, or shows up for you or your family or your business. So there's a lot of different ways. And let's see, some of the ways that are some of the places that we can point our confidence. But before we jump this, I just want okay. to kind of get a little bit more. What I'm hearing is you're saying that it's a feeling that you believe in yourself. Right. But next to this feeling still stays the concept of fear. And fear is not gonna go away. Right. We can be either confident or fearful. The confidence, I think, from that perspective is an ability, despite the fear, still lean into the action that you need to do, trusting that you will find the way. And so that be fearful and still act, still yeah. go, still be in control of self. Right. With Being confident doesn't mean you're not afraid. You know, even in my time in law enforcement, working on a fire department, you know, working anti-terror work, there's plenty of times I was afraid, 
but I was confident enough in who I was and what I knew to keep moving forward anyway. And so that's the incredible thing to have that it can take you outside of your fear or your worry to get the things done that you want to have done that will help you grow or keep you safe. The confidence is like a language of your relationship with fear. <laughs> yeah, you can say that. <laughs> I will talk about language in a second, but it's really interesting to see where that shows up and how the confidence can shape your life. Right, right. So yeah, this confidence, you know, there are all these different ways and I won't explain all these to you. Some of them are pretty self-evident, but whether it's in your business where you're starting a new business or doing something new in your business, the confidence that people see around you will help you to move through that. Uh, whether it's, uh, <laughs> there's just, it, it's amazing how many ways that confidence can help you. In a violent encounter, confidence allows you to think more clearly, to move past your fear. Fear actually causes our brain to change and will move our capability of creativity and executive function back to the place of survival in our brain. So we lose some very important capabilities when we stay in a fear place. And you can find those fear places in all of these, in your social situations. If you're recovering from trauma and having to rebuild your life again, uh, all of those places have a fear factor that can change your thought process and actually change the chemicals of your brain. But when you own the power of who you are and build your confidence, you bring that energy back to the front part of your brain that allows you to make good decisions, that allows you to have clarity and face all the issues uh, in your life and to do them positively. So I'd like to pause here for a second and see in the chat, if you can just put in the chat, which areas of your life of what we suggested so far resonates with you the most? Where do you feel that you might need more confidence? Now thinking about this in the mosaic of situations, in the mosaic of the environments, and not just confident, not confident. So if you can, guys, please work with us in the chat so we can get an idea if we should focus in one area more than another, we have the spectrum leading a team in my business. That's um, a question that could come up. Please use your chat for that so we can get a feel of what we can focus a little bit more with specific strategies. Yeah, it'd be great to know when you're thinking of confidence, are you thinking of it more in a way of success or more in a way of, of safety? Uh, they will actually work positively on each other but it'd be great to hear, you know, how, how some of you are looking at this, which, which way it's in your life most right now. So I'm hearing some things, a little bit more broad career business, but will help to see a bit more specific, maybe in the form of a questions or how to make myself heard as the junior person in the team. That's a great way of asking questions. The, the way we ask questions is the way we look for answers, whether this answer come from us or from within you. So keep conversation going in the chat. We will come back to this in the Q&A section and follow up with those questions later on separately. So how to avoid seeking approval so we can feel that superiority and being under like a hierarchical structure, believing in myself, leading a team. Again, very good question. Um, whether this is a success, the confidence to move forward, or whether this is a safety, the confidence to protect ourselves, because there's a different strategy and different mindset in that. You can also post questions privately, if you want, um, in the tool, everyone versus a private change, so you can be a bit more private if you need to. So we will be looking for your answers and questions and we'll move forward with a one more very interesting perspective, how to be confident when you're not and still be. Um, this is really interesting topic and I would like you to listen to that and re reflect in the chat so we can see what helps the most. So and for back to you. Okay, <laughs> there are four types of confidence that I like to talk about. The first one is a dangerous one. It's fake confidence. And the challenge with fake confidence is 
it's something you're trying to do mentally. You're trying to say the right words. You're trying to look the right way. But what happens is your body knows the truth of whether you're actually confident, whether you're courageous in this moment, whether you're ready to take on whatever it is in front of you. And your body will continue to act a certain way in accordance with the truth, not with something you're pretending to be. So it might be that even while you're trying to project that you're safe and confident, your body might be closing in and shoulders dropping. And that can, uh, I mean, it might fool some people who are just looking for the right answers, you know, maybe like in an employer's uh, interview. But for someone who's a little more predatory, they're going to read those body signals as well. So there is a way to get past that. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. The next kind of confidence I call technical confidence. It means you know your business. You know your job. It's skills-based. Uh, if you're an athlete, you know how to play your sport. So it's, it's technical. It's about a certain way of doing things. And we can use that. You know, if you're an excellent salesperson, uh, you dig into that when you have to stand in front of a boardroom and sell an idea. Okay, so you, you know how to use your technical confidence. Now, borrowed confidence might sound a little bit like it's fake, but it's not because what you're going to do in borrowed confidence is let's say maybe you're in a parking garage and you just feel uncomfortable. You're down there by yourself. All the lights aren't working. You have a little bit of anxiety. Instead of just trying to look confident, you look in your mind, bring an idea to your head or a memory of maybe a technical situation where you are very confident. Uh, any situation where you overcame, where you did incredibly well. Uh, where you know that you are the best you could be and you're proud of yourself. When you bring that to mind, your body doesn't recognize the difference in where you are now and what you're thinking about. So as you bring that situation where you were already very confident into your mind, your body will start adjusting. So now you're not just trying to fake someone. Your body is going to adjust. Your shoulders will go back. You'll stand a little taller. You'll look people more at people more directly in the eye. And that comes across as a body, physical, energetic confidence that shows up, even if it's a predator looking at you. And add to this, it also changes your ability to access your prefrontal cortex executive functions. Because when you go into stress, by definition, we collapse very much not important functions, including that imagination and executive functions of logical thinking, et cetera, into the fight, flight, freeze response, where basically all our energy goes into hands, arms, legs to rise or fight or safe, be safe. So staying in that borrow confidence allows you to also stay in your cognitive abilities to find different ways of communicating. Again, my story of that being kidnapped. It was a fear, but it was, how can I still talk? How can I smile? Can I comment on music? Can I, there's a way of making decisions in the moment so you can use these resources more um, wisely instead of losing access to some of the resources that we have when we go into that hijacked by stress and amygdala response. So borrowed, borrowed um, confidence can also be an imagination. How would X person act in this situation? How would my mom do this? How would my hero do this? Um, and you can pretend to borrow what they would have thinking, what they would have saying, what they could have done. So you engage in the examples, even if they're imaginary, to gain those models of behavior that maybe collapsing at the moment of crisis on a more natural way. Yeah, that's, that's right on. And you know, when an actor or actress does it, it's called method acting. That's why some people can cry on stage and you look at them and go, oh my gosh, they are really heartbroken. They're not acting. They've pulled something up in their imagination or their memory and their body's actually responding to it. And the same thing will happen for being confident and courageous too. 
the next kind is what I call whole life. And that's something I focus on in all of my classes and coursework because it's a confidence that's specifically about who you are, your personal capabilities, your creativity, your focus, your compassion, and taking everything about you and bringing it to the surface so that you can see the power of it. When you do that, you're no longer relying on something outside of you, whether it is your muscular friend that you like to go out with to keep you safe or your position in, uh, in your career to keep you safe. It's something that goes with you everywhere and you can use it every time. It's about believing in yourself, knowing who you are, knowing the true you. And it's incredible because like I say, it goes with you everywhere. There's no pretending to it. And we're going to talk a little bit more in a, in a few minutes about how to find those things within you to bring them out so they are coming across, showing your capability, your confidence, and you're just not a good person to pick on or to try to manipulate. And the whole life confidence, I think, is a really close twin sister to the concept of resilience, right? So confidence is a bit more like your inner state, your emotional feeling, your inner belief. And resilience, it's a little bit more of action forward. Like how do you translate this into certain actions, which again, we'll talk in a second about that. But if you heard these words of resilience and whole life confidence, they really talk to each other very closely, supporting each other. So just kind of mapping out what is already in your sphere of knowledge and zooming your abilities to recognize the context, prepare for this context and even eliminate those contexts by recognizing how to zoom in out of those different metrics of the systems that we're discussing here. And so that basically um, bring us to the conversation, how do you get more comfortable? And by the way, uh, you will be seeing the links in the chat for additional strategies. There's only so much we can cover in 60 minutes. But if you're curious about more, Cranford shared with us his remarkable other strategies and summaries of some of the strategies he talks about here. So feel free to click on the link and access that PDF file so you can have a little chit chat with you if you want to take it further. Yeah, I was back to say, you. Is it okay to ask everybody? You know, I, if you just if you have used borrowed confidence before, would you just put me in the chat? If you've been in a scary place and you dug up something else, uh, I just want to see how many of you have, have experienced that or even tried it. Awesome. Shana Lee. And there's like a very interesting, if we take it a little bit closer to career and business, there is a very interesting research that shows that there's uh, people who were told to stay for two minutes prior to the interview into this form of a winner. You get into a position of a winner. You're a winner. You're, you, you pretend for two minutes in a bathroom prior to exiting, entering into the interview room. And there are people who are asked to just kind of stay in this position of, oh, I'm so afraid. I'm I'm weak, I'm, I'm anxious. And the interviewers had no idea which one was coming from which group and focus group on top of that. And it was a huge percentage of responses and positive assessments of the interviewees through the group of people who were intentionally put in the task to stand in the winning position for two minutes prior to entering the room. So it really kind of shows you how to borrow from a hero, even <laughs> you might not feel like a hero at the moment, like fake it until you make a concept a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's really neat that some of those body adjustments can actually change your attitude. And we're gonna hit, that, hit on that here in just a minute too. So how do you get those abilities to positively handle a situation? And this one right here is so important. It's skills training. Remember we started off talking about, you don't wanna wait until you're in a situation to begin learning. That's the wrong time. Uh, so it's where you look at going to courses, going, getting personal training, getting personal coaching, You know, whether it's for your business or being safe or uh, just how to get out of the boxes you've been stuck in by, uh, by your culture, by society, by your workplace. 
Uh, and one of the ways to do that is recognizing the false beliefs about you. You've heard so much about you, whether it's from media or somebody who didn't believe in you or somebody who is angry at you. And some of those things stick and we want to get those out because, you know, your body listens to you. It listens to what you say about yourself. And another way to do that is to realize that everyone around you is not a monster and the monsters that are around you are not unbeatable. They're humans, they have weaknesses, they have mental challenges and fears and they have physical challenges and problems with their bodies. So to realize that everyone is not unbeatable is such a huge help because it takes you out of being small while they're huge and you go, wait a minute, this is much more even than I ever thought. And it might even be that I'm bigger in my energy or my capability than what I thought was an unbeatable monster. So mind-body hacks are great too. There are so many ways, you know, even when we were talking about borrowing, say borrowing confidence, that's a, a body hack. It's a mind hack. And we're going to go into a few of these a little bit later. I've got about four that I want to share with you. Uh, but there are ways to make your body and your mind do things that you want them to do, even when they're trying to do something different. And most important, when you learn these things, you practice them. You don't practice them at the worst possible time. Just like Olga was saying in the beginning, you practice them in your everyday life um, so that they're there and ready for you. You know, she was talking to me earlier before we started about the mafia kidnapping. And I can't imagine how horrible that was. But after all of that, she has now gone through in her mind and come up with some plans of what to do next time, which means if something does happen, she's not starting with a blank slate. She's ready. There's Are also you a way talk to talk about that a little bit. Just yeah. So one thing to come in mind um, is part of my college education when I was training to be a linguist back in Russia part of this was requirement to work in school and apparently fifth graders are like the most horrible creatures you can imagine I have five kids and they are some one of them is actually in sixth grade now I understand them differently but back then they were like this monkeys on steroids <laughs> to me but what was really interesting, there was this one boy who was the biggest bully in the whole class. He consistently was failing everything. He was very resistant to do anything. He was absolutely dominating the um, bullying everyone, including those A plus students. And it was definitely a challenge. And so the perspective that I took at that time was what if? What if he wants to be a leader and he is frustrated that he fails in what we want him to be a leader in, in academics. And so the only other way he had was to go anti-leader and become an anti kind of villain leader almost. So he will bully everyone as a form of defense of the failing that he felt in the society that expected him to be an A+. And when I took that position, and started talking to him as the best leader in the class who can help me to be the discipline holder because obviously he is the best leader. His demeanor changed 100% because he became a person who was valued for a powerful strength that he recognized and he got recognized for it. And it was put in the place of light. And at that time, that's when my kidnapping happened. It was that same moment. I got into the car, the guy locked the, the car, 60 people in the tram station looked away as if no one was watching how I was literally picked up on the street in the most public place. And he put the music on and it was Gypsy Kings. The first time in my life I heard that music. It was the most fearing situation. But I figured that what if I start dancing to the music because I love ballroom dancing. And it was just this little thing that kind of like, hey, that's a nice music. His reaction was totally like, what are you talking about? I just kidnapped you. It was conversation about the music. Who is this? Where they come from? What culture? What is this? Do you like music? Do you dance? He was totally stunned. And that gave me like a little glimpse into this idea. He wants to be recognized for something. 
and recognize for strengths was his way of communicating. But what if I can recognize him for being something so unique in his mafia group, human, <laughs> that that will link him to me so he can protect me when these other mafia people show up, which is exactly what he did. It was just that shift of what if the bully is actually trying to be someone else. And strangely enough, feeling compassion for him where you can support him as a partner in this conversation instead of being the victim of his bullying behavior. I don't know if that makes sense, but that was really a little tiny lesson of a five, fifth grader that gave me the way out of the very big bully that came literally six months after that. I love that story. I mean, it goes through all of these steps we just looked at. It's something she learned from special forces people she worked with. She knew stuff about herself. She knew stuff about the bad guy. She used all of that, making herself confident, and she was able to keep herself safe and alive and get out of it. So kudos to you, Olga, for being a courageous, confident rock star in a terrible situation. Well, that's what gets you into the life of serving people now as a resilience coach, right? <laughs> but we want to get back a little bit to like a little bit of specific strategies. So hopefully you now heard that there are like buckets where you can think of where do you have strategy, where you have strengths, where do you need more help, where do you need more training? You recognize triggers that initially put you in a place of being unsafe. They come from your experience, from your past, from your perceptions. They could be situation or person or environment linked. But not knowing the triggers pretty much makes it impossible to manage it if you don't know what it is. So get to know your triggers. Think of this, work with someone about this if you can see them yourself. The other underground sort of hidden from us usually place is the filter through see which we translate those triggers into the story to ourselves. They call beliefs. What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about others? I'm a woman. I can't do anything. I am a I don't know, a child, so I have to be this, right? There is a way we can shift that. And then we go into the body. You feel the sensation, the body tells you something is dangerous here, right? Whether it's true or not, it's not the point. The point is that the body produces the sensations. Those three things are kind of less in your control because they're usually not very clear aware. You're not aware of them. But then you start controlling what you think how you decide to deal with your emotions. Remember that calm, calm intensity when you're fearful and you still do it. And the series of action or inaction that you can choose. So from those six buckets, take some time at some point, recognize where you need support, help and strategies. And we're gonna go at least in two of them, the, the thinking point and the body point. So you can get a bit more strategic feel of how easy it can shift this millimeter shift so you get into empowered position whenever you need to. And the first one is that choosing the thoughts and actions that come from that. If you can, if you can talk about this a bit. Yeah, you bet. Uh, this is another one of those things that you want to do in preparation as well as in the point of crisis so that you can do it. To recognize things like that you deserve to be respected, that you deserve to be talked to appropriately, uh, and that you expect it from others. You know, it's important to have that thought in your head. We have a lot to go through here, so I'm just going to hit a few of these, but uh, you have the right to say yes or no to anything. Uh, it might cause a challenge in your, in your world, but it's okay to say no. You know, if that boss or that bully decides that you need to be, go on a date with him, it's okay to say no. Yeah, it might make your job difficult or might make you need to go to a different one, but that's okay. That's power for you to have through choosing your thoughts, to trust yourself and the feelings that you have. You have an incredible intuition. If something feels wrong, lean into it, believe it. There are a lot of people, especially men, that will make fun of intuition that women use. Uh, and it's crazy. It's a, it's a real thing. It's very powerful. But the super important thing is know that you have a choice. It's important. I have a choice. I can choose no. I can choose yes. Um, it's not my fault, but I can own the situation and step into my power and own what I can in that situation. That's a powerful shift, right? 
Um, you can choose that. I don't know how, but I can choose to learn. I'm willing to grow and go into course or buy a book or get into classes of karate. So there's this shift is on you and your level of control. You can choose different actions and be willing to go learn, grow and develop, even if you don't know at the moment. Right, right. And you know, we add that to what's going on outside. We have that authority and position doesn't make it automatically right. Because your boss says you have to do it, that doesn't make it so that you have to agree. We're right back to you have the right to say yes or no. Because someone's in a position of authority or power doesn't make them automatically right. And, and then you go and you position. develop this script. You can prepare for the conversation. It's called difficult conversations. There is a system that you can develop points that you can decide on and then you go and you practice and you practice and you practice with a mirror with a friend with someone else in a safer place so when it comes to the place of talking to your boss you're not coming from just a thought you come in with a preparation that you take place none of this can happen at the moment whether you're fighting with your spouse with your team oh my gosh don't even start in teams and fights this is strategic preparation it's not a gift from god it's not an intuition that someone has and someone doesn't. It's having these systems in place and they're teachable and they're taughtable and they're learnable, but not at the moment of the crisis. And that's where Cranford is so amazing in preparing people, children, teens, and parents to talk these conversations. And you also can choose your action. You can choose to remove yourself from the situation when possible by eliminating toxic people of your life. You remove the situation. You can choose to remove yourself from the situation. Sorry, I cannot talk right now. Let's talk about this tomorrow. I'm too angry and walk away. You can um, prevent the situation. And that's what Cranford is a guru on, how to create your life. So less frequently, the situations pop into your place and create opportunities to grow for yourself and for others, which is extremely important. And so we, we talk about these concepts. Obviously, these six components are very important. I want you to sort of understand where we pointed some of your ideas, and we will share this with you after the presentation as well on thinking. But the other important concept is how you can play with danger and your body, which Cranford is just amazing when he does these exercises. So hopefully we have a couple of those coming up. Um, Cranford, the floor is all yours. Let us be the gurus of our bodies to play with danger and heal how we can be in control. Right. Yeah. There's, I know we're, we're running a little short on time, but I want you to hear these. Uh, and if you have more questions about them, you know, feel free to email me, contact me, and I'm happy to tell you more. Uh, I'm going to talk about four real quick. You've probably heard about adjusting your breathing to feel safer or to calm yourself down. There's actually a way to do it that will affect your brain and your hormonal changes. And the way that works is to slow down your breathing. When you're breathing fast, your body's thinking, I've got to get more oxygen quickly. But to slow it down, um, go ahead and do this with me. I want you to breathe in nice and slow. So it takes about a count of four to get all your air in. One, two, three, four. And you hold it for a second. And then you release it even slower than you brought it in. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now that may not seem like much, but it does huge things in your body. It actually causes your body to say, wait, we're not in danger. And it will slow down. It will change the hormones that's coming out. Uh, that's coming out. It will remove move your thinking from the survival area of your brain back to the executive function area in the front of your brain so that you can be creative and you can make smart decisions. And that works anytime, anywhere, regardless of the danger. It will help your body to go back into a safer place or a safer feeling. Um, another thing you can do, and this is great when you're facing somebody, you know, the breathing thing you can do when you're hiding, you can do it before you go to a place. When you're facing or the presentation. Somebody, yeah, exactly. When you're facing somebody, here's a couple of things you can do. When you adjust the look on your face, 
people's brains will automatically start responding to it. So if you're looking at somebody you're unsure of, it's okay to drop your eyebrows and get more of a serious look. Maybe even borrowing confidence because you know how you are when you're really angry, pull a little bit of that up. Nobody wants any of that, right? Especially not a predator who's actually a coward on the inside. So we get more of an angry look, not raising our eyes up, which is automatic when we get afraid because that's a flag, you know, that you're afraid already. Drop your head, drop your eyebrows a little bit. And while I'm talking about dropping things, drop your voice a little bit. <clears throat> because when we're afraid, we automatically go to a higher register of sound. So when you're telling somebody no, make it a little bit deeper. No. I said no. Deeper is more forceful. And their psychology, their animal brain is picking up that this is more serious than what they thought. It's literally yeah. like you're talking to a dog. Sit, 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 right. versus sit, please. <laughs> right, right. Uh, you know, uh, Olga talked a minute ago about doing champion poses. That works in a couple of different ways. You can do it before you're going into a situation and your body goes, ah, oh, we're a winner. That's great. And it does the right hormones and the right feelings for your body to come across as a winner. But it also works when you're facing a challenge to get bigger. Animals do it. You've seen them raise the hair on their neck or birds that fluff up to look bigger. It's something that happens in our animal brain that goes, oh, they're bigger than I thought. Maybe I should be careful or back off. I it's can crazy. jump in for a second. It's so funny because I have five kids and I have girls and they're like, la, 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 la. And then my boy comes. He is like, ha, ha, ha. And you can see that boys, he gets into this thing. When he was girls, he walks normal. Right. The second thing comes from Russian babushkas. It's like this women who hit their guys all the time. They're like, you know, they're posing into, okay, let's talk. I'm serious here. And just that gorilla walk gets you the feeling of power. Yeah. Sometimes, not always. Right. <laughs> They're spreading out. They're getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. <laughs> and the last one I want to share with you, and this is a great technique. Uh, Air Force pilots use this, military use this, police use this. Uh, and it's something called the applied tension technique and what it will do is it will keep you from fainting because when you're afraid when you're anxious sometimes your blood pressure can drop which is what causes you to faint and you don't want to do that on stage you don't want to do that when you're facing a bad guy so what applied tension is you flex the muscles in your legs and arms now you don't have to do it in front of anybody where you're you know looking like you're posing like Arnold Schwarzenegger you can do this while being still you're just flexing uh, all the muscles, especially your leg muscles, because they're so big and they will help to increase the blood pressure in your body so that you don't pass out or faint. Now, that doesn't mean lock your knees. Locking your knees is a bad thing. But again, that's called the applied tension technique. And it is incredible that just that little bit that you can do, and people won't even notice you're doing it, can get the blood back into your brain to keep you focused. Okay, awesome. that's the four I wanted to share. And yeah, if you have more questions, Send me a note about it. And, I'll be and so to, to kind of wrap it up, it's all about staying clear. Clarity brings confidence, right? Yep, it does. And that confidence, you know, puts an upward spin on everything so that you can stay more focused and clear and decide the right thing to do in an anxious situation or a dangerous situation. It and also, then, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And then we also can stay in that um, moment when you recognize the bad, pre you prepare for bad when it's good. <laughs> right. so that's an important lesson that I hear in your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing that how confidence equals safety is when you're staying confident, again, we've kept our thinking ability up in the front part of our brain so we can be resourceful. We can be creative and see things that we wouldn't have seen before and different ways to do things. And that is can be the very thing that keeps you alive or helps you escape a terrible situation. And finally, we mentioned this earlier, since bad guys are looking for people who are weak and afraid and not confident and have low self-esteem, finding that confidence, believing in yourself, speaking the right words to yourself, and learning from a coach 
an instructor, a trainer, so that it's already within you when bad things happen, you give off the right vibe that tells a predator's radar, not her, you've picked the wrong one, go somewhere else. So we've talked about quite a few things, but this is really the tip of the top of the confidence and safety iceberg. There are hundreds and hundreds of ways to do this. Uh, and I'm excited that we got to share this much with you, but there's so much more. And just a real quick thing, don't think that only the kind of confidence I teach is what will keep you safe. Everything that Olga teaches as well, because it helps you to believe in yourself, to be more successful and more capable, that brings that confidence out in you. The predator doesn't know what it's about. What he knows is you're confident. So that keeps you safe as well. So there's and so I would many like more to ways. Jump in this as well. There's it's not just to be safe, but it's also to be in your powers when you do not feel safe because moving into growth, moving into new, by definition, puts you in a place of uncertain, unknown, and fearful because that's what growth is all about. When you step to the next level, if you've never been before, it will feel unsafe. But learning that ability to feel unsafe and stay in your resilience and stay in your emp empowerment is the place of growth and leadership of self and others and the world that is so important for everything that we do right now. So think of that safe and grow. Where do you need help? Think of those six buckets, what you understand about your triggers, your perceptions, your beliefs, where you need help, what needs to happen for you so you can be more than you are right now. We talked about four different or three different myths, how the preparation for this comes not at the time of a crisis, but at the time of before how you approach this, how you prepare yourself, how you prevent this. That's all the wonderful things that you can learn like when you deal with um, prog programs like Cranford, for example, is teaching. So we're finishing up this. So there's lots of possibilities to take this conversation further. We hope it was helpful. We'd like to see in the chat what was particularly helpful for you. You also have the 10 strategies, the secrets that Cranford shared with you following and in preparing to these conversations. So you have a link in the chat. You can download that if you want to. And if you have any questions, we'll keep the chat open for a little bit. Put your questions in, reach out to either me or Cranford, and we will make sure that we put the Q&A and share with you all the information we have because together we can change the world. And it always starts with you. <laughs> With that, I want to really, really thank Cranford for his amazing, as always, presentation and his calm and quiet and very safe way of doing this. And um, open up to any questions that you may have a few more minutes in the chat, or if you want to speak up. And with that, really thank you for your time and thank you, Cranford, so much. Thank you, Olga. I appreciate the opportunity to share and teach. couple questions that um, we can follow up with, but basically how to stay in your power when you're a junior and when you don't know how to say no to people because you feel that you need to serve them. So this is the place where we, lots of us are experiencing that when we get into this hierarchical structure of dominant boss or dominant person. And then there is a weaker me who must obey or else. So I'm curious if you have your perspective on that, because I certainly have mine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those places where a boss or a supervisor can feel like a threat, you know, and of course, when you're depending on the, the money you make at a job, it can be a, a threat to you. But it's not just about, you don't need to be overbearing. It's about being uh, well, I hate to keep saying confident, but it's such a powerful thing for you to see. Resourceful, to be resourceful, to be confident, to be open and vulnerable to those bosses to say, hey, I'm, you know, I want to help. I want to be here. I want to support what we're doing. Uh, and, and sometimes it really comes not from them. It comes, first question you would ask, is that coming from me? Is that my perception? Because often 
we feel that there is no other way of talking to them but agreeing. And we don't even question the fact that they might be perfectly fine if you explain the situation <laughs> or right. you, if you suggest an alternative. I can't do it today, but I'm more than happy to do it next Wednesday. Right. Or you come up with a delegation. I cannot do this, but there is my friend Maria who is, will be happy. Let me talk to her. So always start with you. In every relationship, you own a part of this relationship. And your job is to own 100% of your part, even if your part is that big, right? It's just like we talked about earlier, knowing the truth about yourself. Maybe somebody else told you your recommendations are no good, but that was their opinion. It's okay for you to believe I'm worthy, I'm smart, I'm capable. People would want to hear what I have to say and I can help. So believing in yourself that way. And there's one way that I teach people in, in the coaching when they come to you, like, how do you feel? Do you feel this or that? It's very simple. You always feel like, well, I feel this. Okay, well, if you feel this, then where is it coming from, you or them? And then you ask yourself a few times, is it true? There's usually it comes from you. It's a story that you attach to this particular situation or person or environment. And that story is what writes the problem generator for you. That story is your beliefs. The story is your past that was never questioned or processed. That story is maybe a lack of some strategies or skills that, guess what, can be developed. That's the beauty of skills. That's the beauty of resilience. It's a skill to be in control of your own inner dialogue. That's what confidence is all about. Right. And as a skill, you can develop it. And that's the beauty of it. You can always be what you want. Everything is possible and there's always a way. Right. You don't have to just practice it with your boss. Practice it with your with your roommate, with your... Teens, <laughs> brothers, sisters, teens. teens. <laughs> teens. <laughs> Yeah, the safe place, safe place where you're not like really risking too much, right? Like you can practice, go with any salesperson, literally put yourself in front of any salesperson and decide that you're going to come out with no, dealing with discomfort of saying no. That's like the best free option for you to practice. Call any roofing guy and ask them to come to talk to you so you can say no and practice that feeling of, <laughs> I feel like I'm taking them down, right? Don't say no if it's a really good deal. <laughs> well, but the point is, you don't have to go to the boss in scary places. Right. You can always learn to swim kind of in a little puddle before with people who are okay with that. Salespeople and saying no to them, that's the best practice ever, right? right. Um, coming out and doing stupid things in front of train on train stations. That's actually what Japanese business people are trained in some of the school's areas. They have to make a fool out of themselves a number of times. By the time you make yourself a fool in front of like thousands of people 30 times, you're not afraid to be a fool the 31st time. You're not afraid time. to mess up anymore, are you? <laughs> and you can do your presentation. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Well, finding reframing. That's a great thing. What if he is right? I'm wrong. Then what would I see? This comes from legal training. Um, we had this fantastic thing about a court, fake court training. When you go into court in front of the judge and you have to, part of the groups for children, there was a kids training we organized, have to protect the three little pigs and prove them being victims. And then there were defenders, they were protecting the wolf. And so the argument really comes with how to argue why he or she or they are wrong and right. And so wolf is self-defending. Wolf needs to eat. Obviously he has to eat pigs and they're stupid enough to make it negligent behavior like that. <laughs> but it teaches you to see perspectives on demand which expands your diversity of mind tricks that you can play with. Again, your ability to tell yourself a more powerful story. And from that story, you're getting more in control of your body, of your prefrontal cortex executive functions, your ability to choose right words. Speak loudly so people can hear me say, no, I don't want to come with you. And things like that, that may not be clearly ready for you unless you think of this contingency plans, right? Right. It's okay to practice in your imagination 
You don't have to wait until something happens. You know, uh, I teach people in my courses when they're watching movies, practice in that movie. What would I do in that situation? What would I say right there? What resource could I grab that I see in that scenery? And again, your brain doesn't know the difference. So that practice, even though it's mental, works. Well, this is awesome. We can talk forever and ever. Cranford, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, we will end if you want the 10 secrets that Cranford shared with us of how to stay confident. You also have a link for that. With that, we'll see you next Wednesday for the conversation with Dr. West on how to stay in the power of your body throughout the journey of a woman. That will be a really interesting dive into how we generate energy and what happens in our systems that our thinking mind doesn't know about. So really encourage you to come and join us. And with that, be healthy, be safe, and we'll see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, everyone, for showing up.